Good morning, TGP. God bless every one of you. Amen. God has a word. God has something for us this morning. And I want us to stand to our feet as we begin to acknowledge the goodness of God. Let us lift up our hands and let us lift up our voices and let us sing unto the goodness and the glory of God. God, you're worthy to be praised. God, you're worthy to be praised. God, we lift you up and we magnify you. God, we give you the praise and we give you the glory. For you are worthy of it. You are worthy of it. You are worthy of it. You are worthy of all the praise and all the glory. We lift you up this morning. We lift you up this morning, Jesus. Yes. We've come to give you praise. We've come to acknowledge your goodness. We come to acknowledge your grace. Come on, Jesus. 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 What a name. Jesus. What a name. Declare his name. Declare his name. Declare his name. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Demons bow with the name of Jesus. We declare Jesus. Oh, glory, 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 glory. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, call my name, call my name. I hear the Lord saying, call the name of Jesus. And you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save. Jesus saves. Hallelujah. Jesus saves. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. We're going to sing, but we have to say the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Come on. Yes. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, the name of Jesus all over this place, all over this city. Let it be known, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. 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 The name of Jesus. The sweetest name, the sweetest name is the name of Jesus. I'm not going to wait, wait for the walls to fall. Because I know a name that will bring them down. I've got to praise waking within my soul, and I'm not ashamed to declare it now. Light of the world, trample the darkness, nothing can stop it. You are the God of the promise, every word will be a calm. Nothing can stop it. You are the God of the promise. Prepare the way, the King of glory comes. Before his name, every fear must bow. 
Throw off your chains. Jesus destroyed them all. Oh, up from the grave, he is with us now. Light of the world, trample the darkness. Nothing can stop it. You are the God of the promise. Every word will be accomplished. Nothing can stop it. You are the God of the promise. The gates of hell will never stand a chance. Your name prevails, Jesus, the great I am. No word will fail, no weapon formed against. Your name prevails, Jesus, the great I am. The gates of hell will never stand a chance your name prevails Jesus the great I am no word will fail no weapon formed against your name prevails Jesus the great I am light of the world trample the darkness Nothing can stop it. You are the God of the promise. Every word will be accomplished. Nothing can stop it. You are the God of the promise. give him a hand clap of praise in this place we thank you Jesus
I give you glory for all you brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward to follow after you. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord. Grace has been enough, and I'm believing the best is yet to come. The cross before me, my hope on things above, and in you, Jesus, the best is yet to come. Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord.
So come now, Lord, like never before. Oh, we worship you in this place this morning. We worship you, Jesus. You are the God of the promise. Let's just take a moment and let's just focus on him this morning. Let's just shift our eyes to our creator this morning. Oh, we worship you. We worship you, Father. We exalt you in this place. We lift our worship to you, Father. Let it be a sweet sound in your ear this morning. Oh, come on, church. Worship the Father this morning in this place. We welcome you. We welcome you into this place. We praise you, Father. We thank you for your goodness and mercy. You're an all-powerful Father. We reverence you in this house. Oh, we thank you for your presence here. You are good. You are a God that cannot lie. Your promise is true. Almighty God, we worship you in this house. We invite your presence here. Praise you, Jesus. Spirit like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Your name is like honey 
on my lips your spirit like water to my soul your word is a lamp on to my feet jesus i love you i love you 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 come on and just sing it to him this morning we love you in this place Jesus, I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. feel the Lord this morning. Come on, I said I feel the Lord this morning. I feel the Lord's presence this morning. What the Lord has been doing in this body this year, we've seen healing. We've seen His presence touch minds. And this morning, I believe He's doing just that again. That He's doing this new thing that was released about this house the first Sunday of January. And I believe this song and, and the songs that we've sang this morning about the promise, about the breakthrough. See, you don't need a breakthrough, you need Jesus. He is the breakthrough. You don't need more money, you don't need this or that, you need Jesus. He is everything. Come on, I said He is everything. And this morning as we're singing this song, this is a song of adoration. This is the song of the new covenant. See, the promise is I won't leave you as orphans. The promise is the world doesn't know me so they won't see me, but you know me so you'll see me. And this morning, the open door that was sang about, I feel like the Lord, as we sing this in spirit and truth, the Lord wants to look at you face to face. As a man looks in a mirror, the Lord wants to look at you this morning. That breakthrough is through eye contact with the Lord. That breakthrough that you need for your family, that breakthrough you're believing for is eye contact with the man Christ Jesus. 
And so this morning, I want to let it rise in your spirit. I want you to start to release your sound of Jesus, I love you, and let it build and look at the man Jesus. Jesus, I love you more than this world. Jesus, I love you more than this addiction. Jesus, I love you more than this distraction. And I will worship you. I will live for you. Jesus, I am yours and you are mine. Come on, lift it up to him. Right now, just release your sound. Release it. Come on. Come on, begin to sing, worship team. Jesus, I love you. Let it rise. Let it rise. We draw near to you, Jesus. We draw near to you. We are. This is how we worship you, King of Kings. surrender, we surrender to you, we lay it all down, we lay it all down, at your feet, Jesus, you are our hope, true life. Come on, you 
are good. You are good. You are good. You are good. Come on, this is our time to respond. And you are good. Come on, yes. Yes, you are good. Come on, all together, let's declare it. Come on, say, you are good. Come on. Just those three words, come on. You are good. Come on, come on, praise team, declare it. You're good. You are good. Jesus. Yes. You are good. Oh, Jesus. You are good. Jesus, we thank you. And we believe that you are good. God is so good. Well, good morning to each and every one of you. Can I let you know that God is good? And all the time, God is good. He's worthy of all the praise. All the praise. We're going to be celebrating communion together, and if you haven't received your element and you would like to participate with us in communion, I want to give you an opportunity to go and to get your element. They're at the back. If you didn't get one coming in. And as you get your element, we want you to come, and you can be seated so we can participate together. Let's stay in this attitude of worship, this attitude of giving God praise and glory. Are good. Come on, you are good. You're good, you are. Come on, you are good. God, you're so good, you are. Rick, will you come at this time and lead us in a time of communion? Come on, God is so good. I sense his presence is here. I agree, Minister Blaine. God wants to encounter us face to face. And communion is one of those opportunities for us to do that. As you prepare the, uh, the cup and the bread this morning, I'd like to read out of Isaiah uh, chapter 53, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men and a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid it as our, were, as our faces from him. He was despised and esteemed. We esteemed him not. 
Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and we, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. As you prepare the uh, elements, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 23 for I have received uh, verse uh, chapter 11 23 for I have received of the Lord that which I also also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed he took the bread if you'd take the bread please and when he, he had given thanks he brake it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me as you take the bread let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the price that was paid through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you, Lord, that anything in life, Father, it goes through the ages. You set the precedent that there must always be a sacrifice for anything great. And there is no greater need than man be forgiven of their sins. And that, uh, that, that act uh, of forgiveness came with a great price and we thank you Jesus you paid that price it was written in the Old Testament it was prophesied that there would be a sacrifice for our sins and, and, and it would have no uh, uh, glory of men in it but there, it would be glorified by the Father and, and so Father we thank you Lord that, that you uh, Jesus paid that price for us in the breaking of your body in the death of your son, Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord, this day. In Jesus' name, if you would take and eat of the body. The Bible says in verse 25, after the same manner, also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. If you would take the cup, please, and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. Uh, the, the cup we have today is a symbolization, Lord, of your blood that was poured out for us. The sacrifice of your blood, Father, we thank you, Jesus, for healing us through this blood. For setting us through, free through this blood. We thank you, Lord God, that as you were on the cross, uh, Lord God, that blood and water flowed when, when you were pierced. And we thank you that through that we are redeemed by your blood. We meet today because of your blood. And we give you the glory and the honor. We raise our hands. We say, Father, if it wasn't for your sacrifice through Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for us, we would not even be here today. And so we give you the glory. I pray for ones today that are struggling that need that release, that need that redemption through you. I pray that they would have that today in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. If you take the cup, God bless you. Amen. What can wash away sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what Away my sin, 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the Amen. God is good. And I know what year you are having so far, but what I want to decree and declare over your life is that God makes all things new. And so I believe that this is not just an amazing year for my life personally, but I believe that as God has called my wife and I and so many of you in this hour, that God is doing something big in this city. All right, I'll take the three or four amens. Come on. God is all about cities. He really is. And I believe that he has positioned us. We have been faithful. And in the weeks and months to come, he's going to reveal his will to us. And I want to pray for us before Pastor Teresa comes and we receive our tithes and offering and give you an opportunity to participate in the culture of generosity and, and doing that. But I want to pray that we get ready for the big things that God is doing. So big that we have to give him all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. That you can't explain it. It's just God. Who wants one of those? Just a, it's God. I'm talking the book of Acts coming alive. To where the gates just open up with no man touching it. Come on. That's in the Bible, by the way. That Peter walked up to the gate and just opened on his own. Because God's doing something big that innate objects have to obey the object. Come on. 
that God's purpose is stronger than the gates. And if the gate had to open up for Peter, how much more the gates of hell will not prevail against the church because God's doing something big. And it is an honor and a privilege. It really is. To pastor this church in this season, many great men and women of God have graced this place over the 20 years plus that we've been here. That have labored, that believe God. And here now we are moving into a time and in a place where God is saying, I still got more. But don't get comfortable, I still got more. I want this city, come on. We didn't just invest and put a billboard up that said, Jesus is Lord, just for the sake of doing that. We put up because it was decree. It was a kingdom declaration with no church affiliation but Jesus alone because he's building the church. Can I get someone to give God praise and glory? Come on. We don't need no name recognition. We need his name to be declared. And he's telling us let's not get comfortable in 2022. Come on. Oh, I feel someone needs to expand their thinking. Come on, come on, come on. I'm going to pray, but I, I need you to think bigger. I need you to think bigger. I need you to think God-sized dreams. That without God is impossible. And so collectively, if we do that, I promise you, well, God is confirming that he's going to do great things in our lives. Hallelujah. Bow your heads with me, please. And after I pray, Pastor Teresa will come. I want you to do this as well. If you're here with your family, and just hold their hand. And I know in the time we live in, everything is cooties. You know what I mean? So let's. Uh, remember one time you were able to cough, and it was like, God bless you. Now it's like, whoa, you know. Um, I'm serious. Enemies having a field day with that stuff, man. We're not touching on the green anymore. Mm, God is so good. Come on, that hand that you're holding, they're believing God for a miracle. Mmm. Father, we need you. We need your grace. And the hand that I hold right now, I pray grace will be released in them. A grace that flows from the crown of their head so their thinking will expand. A grace that will flow to their hearts so they will believe yet again. A grace that moves to our knees so we would bend them and pray only to you. And a grace that moves to our feet so we will walk in perfect peace. Father, we need you. And we commit to steward that which you're doing in my life personally and prophetically. Have your way, Jesus. And we declare territory, come on, that this city and the surrounding city, you are Lord. And the greatest harvest of souls will be manifested because of your goodness and your kindness. We honor you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Teresa, will you come? This time, hallelujah, God is so good. God is so, 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 so good. That was a good word, Vic. We will be comforted. There's not a promise for comfortable. Right? We will be stretched. Um... Persecution's coming. God didn't promise us comfortable. 
but he did promise us comfort. Amen. Amen. Back in the day, uh, if I were going to go someplace, I had a big old paper map. I know some of you can't even relate to that. But you'd be in the car with this big old paper map, trying to map out your way. And, and if you were an irresponsible driver like I was at times, you'd try to steer with your knee and look at this big paper map and try to figure out where you were going. And <laughs> Oh, my goodness, there's a better way. There's a better way. And what would it be like if I were to try to do that today? We have a lot of family members that are doing that. We have a lot of people that we love that are doing that. And there's a better way. There's a better way. Thank you, Lord. And put in our destination, the heart of God. And he'll lead us there. He'll lead us there. It's the Holy Spirit, the GPS that whispers to us the direction. This is the way. Walk ye in it. You turn to the right or to the left. It's the Holy Spirit. It's our GPS system. God's protection. Sister. Amen. Amen. We're going to honor the Lord. I, I like how Pastor Rose says it's a culture of giving. It's not just this little time in the service, this little time in our lives that we maybe write out a check or text or something. But it's a culture. It's who we are. As God's children, as children of a generous father, we're generous people. So we can obey God without fear. We can obey without fear. So if you're making a check, you can write it to TGP. You can give online or by text. We'll just take a moment here and just worship, take this time of service to just honor him in our giving. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you guide us in everything. Every step we take, Lord, we choose to obey. You lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Thank you, Father. We sow our seed this morning in expectation, Lord, of your goodness. Always in expectation of your goodness, Lord. You don't withhold anything from us, Lord. And we ask for grace that we will not withhold anything from you that you ask of us, Father. We love you this morning, Lord. We love you, God. We just yield to you in our giving. You are good. You are good. Thank you, Lord. And you can just uh, put your offering into the box in the back. Amen. Right. Uh, before we release our children and our teens, will be leading today. Uh, we have a couple of announcements we want to share with you. Again, a reminder that there will be Inspire Marion uh, this coming Wednesday. Uh, Ignite, uh, they meet at 6.30 to 8 p.m. Um, and so uh, we want to make you be aware of that. But there will be no Royal Rangers or Girls Ministries this Wednesday. Uh, they will meet the next uh, Wednesday. So again, no Royal Rangers or Girl Ministries this coming Wednesday. Uh, they meet next week as well. Um, it's camp time, and this is where we have our winter camp. And so we're going to invite it the three. Where are the three? Do you, who's not here? Hannah? So we have two. So we have Bailey and Lizzie. Let's put our hands together for our teens. They're going to come, and they're going to share with us. Why you should give for camp and why you should send your teens for camp and why teens should go and all things camp. All right. Hey, guys. So this is my last winter camp that I'll be going to because I'll be graduating next year. But I have been going to camp ever since, like, what, seventh, 
seventh grade, like for every year for a long time. And I can just say from experience what an amazing time it is of not even just growing closer with your youth group, but growing co closer with the Lord and learning about him in such a new and different way every single time where he teaches me new things every single year. Like when you think God's done, he's like, no, I have so much more to teach you. And so from last year, last camp, he really taught me about how he sees me as Elizabeth and not as Rowan and Magon's daughter, Daniela's sister. And, I'm, and he's just been speaking to me about this amazing stuff that he's going to be teaching me this winter camp. So I'm so excited to go to winter camp with, with all my youth group friends. And yeah, so if there's anyone that you know from 6th to 12th grade, I believe that's what it is. Yeah. Anyone from 6th to 12th grade, please invite them to come and please, yeah. Hi. Um, last year was my first year going to the summer camp, and then this year will be my first year going to winter camp. But last year at summer camp, I would say the Lord did um, a work beyond anything that I, I guess I would say, allowed him to. Because I never, like, going into camp, I didn't really want God to work in my life. But um, those of you who know, he doesn't really listen to you. So <laughs> he's going to have his way no matter what, and that's what he showed me. And so last year at camp, um, he just showed me so many things, and he's still working, and I've grown so much from camp, and he's still doing a work in my life every single day, even though I'm not at camp. And so, like Lizzie said, if you guys know anybody from 6th to 12th grade that needs something done in their life, or they even need to get saved, like, at camp would be the greatest experience, because you get away from all the distractions that you have in everyday life. So, yeah, it would just be great for them to come along. Good stuff. So if the Lord so moves upon your heart and you want to give towards uh, camp, uh, we'd really appreciate that. We thank God for uh, individuals every year when we do camp. This church is amazed in your support of our young people. And so thank you so much. Many of you have given and made it possible for those teens that want to go. Even last minute, we sneak them in uh, because you guys are able to do that. So. Uh, we're excited again for camp. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call Kimba. She'll come and share her awesome announcement and excitement. Put your hands together for Kimba. Good morning. As Pastor said, my name is Kimba. I'm here representing the singles ministry and the singles committee who are very excited about our upcoming book club. Um, the Singles Ministry is for single men and single women who are seeking wholeness, seeking to evaluate their past blind spots, purposing to no longer settle, willing to lay down marriage as an, as an idol, open to meeting new people and having fun, and for singles who desire to be prepared with tools and a plan to be the one and find the one. So we're in a season of fresh and new and change here at TGP. So this is a great opportunity to do that by joining our um, book club and for those of you online as well. So if this resonates with you, last time I was up here, I forgot to read the details. So <laughs> um, the book is called Outdated, Daniela's awesome flyer she created for us, Finding Love That Lasts When Dating Has Changed. It will be on Mondays here at the church from 6 to 7.15. Um, if you want any more information, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and online. Yes, I think we're pretty hip. Um, I just want to read what someone said about this book, Outdated. Modern dating is already outdated. It causes pain and problems and often leads to confusion and frustration. In this book, Outdated, the author reveals that the Bible is full of wisdom principles we can use to find incredible joy while dating. Please join us. All right. Just one final announcement. Yeah. Good morning. Um, how are you? It's snowing outside, everybody. <laughs> Um, I told Ro like three 
good snowfalls, then I'll take down my tree. So this is number two. And uh, <laughs> one more. It's really cool. Um, so next week, we are going to have our vision cast and business meeting. It's a yearly thing that we do um, for members. And we even invite those who just come every week. You can come as well just to hear what God's doing at TGP throughout the year. Um, so that will be next week after church. Ro usually will cast vision and we'll probably end maybe quarter to 12 so that we can go through the business and uh, so you're not here late that day. So please make plans to stay next week. This week I emailed, if I had your email, um, your giving statements for last year. If you did not receive it, it's because we don't have your email address. So I did print out those that didn't um, get emailed and if we don't have your address, they will not be mailed either. But you can pick them up today after church. I will be somewhere. I won't hide today. I'll be visible somewhere so that you can pick it up. Um, so please check your email. Uh, check your spam. It shouldn't go to spam because it's a legit email address. Um, but your giving statement is there. So please make plans to stay next week. And uh, that's it. Awesome. Right. Well, at this time, we're going to give an opportunity to greet one another and to release our teens and our children for the time of ministry. And then we'll get right into the word of the Lord. Praise God.
Oh, I thought I could time it right. Oh, my goodness. I underestimated how, many t how much time I had. All right, praise God. Amen. Well, get your Bibles in your hand or on your phone. Open up your app, whatever means you have for the word of the Lord. I'm super excited about sharing the word with you this morning. Um, as you get yourself ready, as we center and get our hearts back on the things that are important to God, which is his word and his word and the effect that it has in our lives. Let me invite you, please, to bow your head and let's get into a word of prayer, and then we'll read our, our text, which is Titus chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Titus chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you are doing in our lives. We honor you. We praise you. We give you the glory. We magnify you because you are worthy of it. And when we magnify you, we see your greatness and your goodness. We pray for the word of God that it will bring um, clarity to us, Lord. That Jesus declared he only spoke and did what the Father told him. So we pray, God, that as I minister the word of God, it's only what you want to be said. We need you, Lord God. As we see all that's taking place. On this side of heaven, we need an encounter with the God who created the heaven and the earth. And so we pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that that will be encountered and experienced today. As we honor, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, would your Bible turn to the book of Titus? It's a short book, a couple of chapters. The book of Titus, written by the Apostle Paul. And my assignment this morning is to position us in a manner of which our mind and our heart will expand and that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has a purpose for us and that we must be stewards of that purpose and that we will trust God. I often tell the council when we meet and we discuss kingdom assignments, I said our responsibility is to put everything on the table and trust that the wind of the Holy Spirit will blow on the table and whatever remains, God is saying, I want you to accomplish this. And so that is what I believe he's doing in this hour with this ministry and with you and with me is that the wind of the Holy Spirit is blowing and he says, whatever remains. That's what I want you to do. And so in Titus chapter number 1, verse 1 to 3, it reads, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And it says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And now Paul gives the purpose of why he's writing this particular book to these individuals, which is really, it's geared towards his spiritual son, Titus. He says, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of of the truth which accords with godliness. So there is a connection between belief and behavior. And he's saying that as you come to understand who you are and whose you are, when you have the knowledge of the truth, that will affect then the way that you behave. Remember now, Titus is going to be pastor in this church, it's a pastoral epistle. And so the Apostle Paul wants to make sure that he understands that this is called the faith of God's elect. I want you to write this down, and I want you to get a hold of this. Know the difference between your ability. Write this down, your ability to choose. Write it down. you got to know the difference between your ability to choose and being chosen. You will hear a lot of preaching about your ability to choose. But very few will preach about your chosen. And what Paul is saying here is not addressing your ability to choose. He's addressing the fact that you're elect, so you've been chosen. And because you're chosen, godliness now becomes something you embrace. Because it's the God factor. If you don't get this, the rest of what Paul is teaching Titus, as he's entering a very hostile place... 
called the creeds who were known as liars, cheaters, just like us today, right? You know what I mean? Just relevant. In the world we live in, of where we have to be able to have an assurance and a hope that God is for us and not against us. Come on. And so he goes on and he wants us to understand that. So from this day forward, the way you destroy sin in your life is not you embrace the fact you have a choice to resist sin. It's because you've been chosen out of sin. Come on. You got to write that down because some of our struggles, God is saying, why are you struggling in that area? That's an issue of the flesh and you don't understand who you are and whose you are. So there are things you have to work out, but there's things that's already been worked in you. Come on. Oh, this is so good, and I haven't even gotten to the second verse yet. <laughs> the moment you gave your heart to the Lord, you are no longer just created by God. You're no longer just a child of God. You are now chosen by God. Oh, come on. I'm telling you right now, there's a struggle you're facing, and the issue is not Satan. You just don't know that you're chosen. He will make you all day say you're created by God. Because people argue, I was born this way. Come on. That's because the enemy has them in the realm of creation. And if we become a child of God, we can become religious knowing that we're a child of God. And have false security. Come on. But when you're chosen, you understand that he says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I supersede the ability I gave you because I have more authority than your ability. Oh, come on. And when we understand that, you understand what Paul was saying to Titus. He's saying, Titus, this message that I'm giving you to give to this particular church, they have to know that they are elected by God. So the gathering place, I say it over and over again, God brought me here because God says, I've chosen you, Rowan, to go to a people I've chosen. Oh, come on. And that's how I pastor. I don't pastor you based on creation because you can battle and debate me all day about behavior. I'm not going to waste my time arguing over behavior because you will always say, oh, I want to have it my way. And because of your ability to choose, anything I do that supersedes that, I'll be judgmental. So I don't speak to that part of you. I speak to the reality that you've been chosen by God. And there's a work he's doing in you. Come on. And knowing you're elected by God, how you see life is so different. And Paul is saying, Titus, you can't see life like how they see it. You can't, you can't pull them. You can't influence them if you're like them. And so he goes on and he says, I want you to understand that. That's just verse 1. I can close the Bible and go home right there. Amen. Let that sink in right there. I keep hearing the Lord say, Ro, their struggle is because they won't release their ability so Mike can have my authority. You're holding on to things that God has said. It's not benefiting you at all. It's pleasurable, but it's not purposeful. Come on. And so he's writing and he's telling them this, and then he goes on. And he says, here's why, in verse number 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted. That's it, TGP, by the command of God our Savior. So what we are doing, we have been entrusted by God. We can't get out of it even if we tried. That there's an assignment that God has for us, a, a place that God has taken us, that we must get there. Why? Because it's about legacy and not just longevity. Come on, somebody. 
It's about leaving something for a generation yet not born. It's leaving a legacy for my grandson. Come on, it's not longevity. It's not how long I live. I praise God I live a long life. But I would rather leave a legacy than have longevity. Come on. Ooh. So God is calling us as a church. He said, you got to preach this gospel. You have to live this way. Why? Because it's about legacy. That this church exists because I'm the one that's giving it life. I'm the one that's giving it life. I'm the one that's giving it life. And so what he wants us to understand is this. God is the promise keeper. And not just a promise maker. There's a big difference between God who makes promises, but the God who can keep those promises. Come on. That's where the battle is. That's where the battle is. There's over 7,000, according to one theologian or one research that I read, that says over 7,000 promises of God in the Bible. 7,000 of them. And so uh, Walt Kaiser, he points out, he says that in many of the books in the Bible, it's really about the promise plan of God. A New Testament scholar, Scott Haifman, says the message of the Bible is this, the God of promise and the life of faith. He summarized the entire New Testament by declaring that's what it is. And so here is the Apostle Paul, and he's talking now, and he brings up this rich theology in the midst of his introduction. This is just Paul's introduction of his letter. And we're going to be able to camp right because there's so much rich theology. You see, the Apostle Paul, in his introduction, realized that he was called by God to promote the faith of God's elect. He realized that I exist to promote the faith. To promote the faith. He says, I exist to promote the faith and so that you will have knowledge of the truth. That you will know that you are chosen by God. Why? Because you have been given the grace of God in your life for God's purpose. Someone say purpose. Purpose is a good word. It's how God operates. And so what I want to describe to you is that Paul is a model of a leader for life. And that's why we began by offering you the goal setting and goal achievement. Leaders for life. And we're going to continue on that for the next year. Why? Because it's important that we understand that I am chosen by God to promote the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth. So in other words, God chose me. He called me by faith. And so I promote now the knowledge of truth. Why? Because as he wrote here, there's lies out there. There's lies. And so he goes on. And so Paul then... He unpacks all of this, and he gives us a rich theological doctrine in his introduction. And so here's what Paul wants to recognize. He's saying, Titus, you must know who you are. You must know that you're chosen and not just a child of God. You must know that you're chosen. He goes on and says, you must know the purpose of life as a believer. As a kingdom believer, we have to know the purpose of life. He mentions that, write this down, faith is important. He writes down hope is important. He lets us know that patience is important. He gives all these things, and then he wraps it up and given the attribute of God, which is really this God is a promise keeper. He's not just saying that he's a promise maker. He says he's deep in that. He's a promise keeper. Any one of us can make a promise. Just open your mouth. It doesn't take anything to make a promise. You can write a promise. You can speak a promise. But what we have to understand is that where the real power comes in is the ability to keep the promise. And so here's the deal, is that given how life has been dealing with us since 2019, 2020. And I don't know about you, but I keep asking God, when will this thing be over? Can I get a witness up in this place? If you haven't asked the question, when will these politicians just retire? I'm only messing around. You know, when will we get back to, it ain't happening. That's not happening. If you haven't noticed by now, that ain't happening. It's a new reality for the body of Christ. And so, we see now that, now more than ever, and I quote, where there seems to be no solid ground beneath our feet, we stand on the promises of God. 
And we stand on the promise of God, but people are still dying. Relationships are still deteriorating. Come on. Life is still happening. You have a promise from God, but life didn't get the memo. Come on, somebody. Right? You, God gave you a promise, and, and you're here, grow back, you know, you're all good. But life says, I didn't get that memo. And so in the midst of having a promise from God, we get great at quoting it, but do we really believe it? And so Paul wants Titus to know that, listen, 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 Titus, you've got to understand that the promises of God is where we begin, but there's something greater about the God who gave the promise. He says here, and I quote, God promises play a vital role in helping believers grow in sanctification and in the moments of struggle demonstrates faith and at the time of suffering to have patience because there is hope in the midst of all that's taking place. God is not asleep. God knows exactly what's going on. And he's given us his promises that we can hold on to, that we can hold on to. So I want to encourage you today and for the rest of 2022 is to go through your Bible and highlight the promises of God. you got to start there because it's in that start that we're able to understand the depth. Someone say the depth. Come on, you got to understand the depth of God and who he is. If we are going to make a difference and step into the new reality, we have to go deeper in our understanding of God. Listen, what got you saved and that early prayer, that's not going to keep you. Come on, listen to me. That you have to be growing in sanctification. you got to be growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you're not growing, come on, if you're still learning elementary stuff, then you're in danger and you're in trouble. We've got to go deeper. Someone say go deeper. See, so the promise of God, these promises are absolutely amazing. They're, they're beautiful, and they give us stability. They give us something to hold on to at a funeral. you got to have the promise of God of a resurrection. you got to have something to hold on to. In the midst of destruction in your home, in the midst of all that's taking place, there's got to be something. And so we search throughout the scriptures to find the promises of God. But there will be moments, my brothers and sisters, when the promises of God, unfortunately, will seem powerless to quiet our fears. There will be moments in your life where the promises of God will not soothe our grief. They will not lift our worries or motivate our obedience. Simply just on the promise of God, his ability to make a promise doesn't necessarily, when life comes, causes us to be motivated to be obedient. I want that to sink in right now. God, who is almighty, can give you a promise. He can make a promise, and yet there will still be moments where what you're going through seems larger than the God who gave the promise. Let's be honest. I got our both hands and feet up. Come on. And so what we need is to understand that Paul recognized this when he was talking to Titus. And I want to let you know as well that as God has given us our assignment and trusted things to us, as we hold on to the promise, there will be moments of where the circumstance on the outside will seem greater than the God who gave you the promise on the inside. But there is hope. Someone said there's hope. There is hope. Because what Paul did was he introduced not just the God of promises. Paul introduced the promise keeper. And what we want to do this morning is to shift your mind as the elect and to recognize and get a revelation, a new reality of the promise keeper. What I'm about to share with you absolutely is going to make you see God in a different way and let you tell that devil to shut up and get out of your life. Come on. Come on and tell that fear he's got to go, right? Tell fear you got to go. You got to go. So what we need to do is more than simply hear his promises again. That's preaching. And you hear the message of preaching, and, and we'll hear the message of preaching, and we'll leave this place, and as soon as we get outside, and you hit the snow and the cold, or something happens, you get a phone call, all of a sudden, what happened to your Sunday morning session? Guess what happened? It goes right out the window, and you go back to normal. We go right back to normal again. So it's almost like life is waiting outside the door, like, hey, who's first to come out? See? 
And the moment you leave, the moment you leave, all of a sudden your kids get on your last nerves. Because <laughs> life is waiting out there. And so what we have to understand is that it's not just simply hearing his promises again and again and again. What we need is assurance and hope. We need to behold the God who gives the promise for he is the promise keeper. And once you know the promise keeper, every promise that comes from God is yes in Christ and amen to the glory of God. That's a rich text right there in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Right after he talks about the comfort, come on. Right after he talks about that, he goes into and talks about that all the promises of God are yes in Christ and are amen to the glory of God. And in this series that we're talking about, we're going to see that the promise keeper, right, is different than keeping promises. That you can't keep a promise without knowing the promise keeper. So if you're telling your family and friends and you're giving them promises, you need to know the promise keeper so you have the power to keep the promise. Oh. And so what he's saying is this, church, you got to be promise keeping. Come on. And ready? And truth telling. <laughs> It's so good. It's called the two sides of promise. There's promise keeping and there's truth telling. And so we have to know the promise keeper. And so, so I want you to go to Genesis. You know me. We have to always go back to Genesis, right? So come on. In my time, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to show you something, a revelation of the promise keeper that I had never seen until I was studying this. And I was like, look at, look at, look at here. This was something. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. But I always say everything begins in Genesis. Everything begins in Genesis. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. So we're going to introduce to you the promise keeper. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, this is what it says. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, the man and his wife, so both, hid themselves from where? The presence of the Lord. God among the trees of the garden. So in introducing the promise keeper, here's the first thing I'm realizing about the promise keeper and how the promise keeper have to keep his word. And so the question I was asking, so God, why did you show up? Why didn't you just call them from a different place? Like, why did you actually go to where they were? And here is what was said. He said, because if I didn't, I would give the enemy, come on, grounds to say that I don't keep my promise. I told them when I created them that I've given you my spirit. Oh, that I've breathed into you the breath of life and man became a living being. And so what he's saying is that I am committed to you because I gave my word. My word was this, write this down. I promise never to leave you. That's the first thing with the promise keeper. He says, I promise to never leave you. And so all of a sudden, what happened? They separated from God. They disobeyed God. And God was showing up as he consistently was, was, was always doing. And they hid from him. But God came and so says, listen, though you're inconsistent, though you're unfaithful, I must remain faithful. Come on. Though you broke a promise, I can't break a promise. And so in the midst of their condition of where they were exposed to the elements and their eyes were open and they saw that they were naked and they disobeyed God. Come on, can I add more things to it? And everything that was wretched and everything that was against God and everything that was violated, God, God still says, I'm the promise keeper and I promise I'll never leave you. you ready for this? Not just because you're my creation. Come on. In time, we can say that's what it was. And not just because you're my children. He says, the reason why I'm a promise keeper and the reason why I never left you is because you're chosen. Oh. Come on, somebody. On this side of heaven, we see failure and we see a separation. And God says, yes, I have to judge it. But the enemy now is trying to set God up to do what? Discredit his character as a promise keeper. The enemy is saying, God, you can make all the promises you want, but can you keep a promise when they're in sin? Oh, God. And so the enemy's trying to bring up a barrier, come on, between God and his word. Not God and you, but God and his word. Hey, I gave my word, I won't leave you. Not because of you, but because of me. I gave my word. You can be unfaithful, but God has said, I can never be unfaithful. And so when you separate it from me, God says, I can't separate from you. 
Come on, somebody. That's a good place to give God praise and glory. My God, if you ever got a revelation of who you are and the price that God paid, as Minister Rick said, for your life, God says, I will make every barrier open up for you. Come on, there is nothing that would stand and hold me against my love for you. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Why? He's the promise keeper. He said, I promise never to leave you. You left me, but God said, I never left you. And that's dangerous because some people will confuse God's covenant with God's approval. You with him because God's there and you feel him in your big toe that God must be okay. And God's like, no, I gave my word. I came to you because of my word. Come on. I came to you because of my word. Not because of your worries. I came to you because of my word. Oh, that's so good. He goes, the promise keeper. That's the first thing we have to recognize right now. That wherever you are, God is saying, I promise never to leave you. Never to leave you. And that's dangerous when we have the ability to make choices. And God knew that and still said, I'm still not going to take that away from you. And so we look at freedom. But we don't see freedom as God sees it. Because freedom without truth is really not freedom. Right? Freedom needs the ability to see truth. Not the lies, but the truth. I'm told that when you work at a bank, they don't show you the counterfeit. They show you the truth. The truth. The authentic currency. And because you see the truth so much, you have the ability now, the freedom to recognize the truth from the false. And so what God has always been about is truth, not about false. He's always been about truth. Why? And the truth is, I promise I'll never leave you. That's the first thing I promise you. i got to get off of that. So watch this now. So now in Genesis, go to Genesis chapter 3, right? Go to verse 22 and verse 24. If you thought that was a nugget, wait till you see this one. So God's behavior, his nature, just at that, when he says, Adam, where are you? And he comes to show up. That alone should get us on our knees. But God's like, I'm not done yet. As the promise keeper, there's also another dimension of who I am and my nature. And now in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22 to verse 24, listen to what it says. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Who's speaking? God is. He says, behold, the man, after all the judgment, right, after all the judgment took place. So God didn't uh, 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 bypass what they did. Judgment came. So the promises of God are both, and when God promises something, he has to fulfill what it is. So God judges. So he judges the serpent. He judges man. He judges the woman. He judges the earth. He does all of that, and he says, I'm not finished. I'm a promise keeper. And then he says, the man has become like one of us, knowing what? Good and evil. Now look at this. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat. I'll make sure something. And do what? Oh, oh. They already sinned. Their eyes were open. And he goes and I promise never to leave you. And then on top of that, he brings the judgment. And now he's not finished. He goes, I have one more thing to do as the promise keeper. He goes and says this now. Lest they eat of the tree of life and do what? Live. Live forever in that condition. Oh, come on. So eternal was always in the mind of God. We think eternity starts when you get to heaven. Oh, no, it started the moment you confess Christ. So everything you do, there's a promised future. Oh, come on, somebody. Oh. But there's a God who meets you in your present. And so he gives you a promise. He makes a promise about your future that brings hope and anticipation and things are going to be okay and all things are going to work together for good. And he says, I'm making all things new. But God shows up again and he says, listen, listen, I come here and he says, unless they live forever in that condition. And this is what he does. Therefore the Lord God sent them out from the garden of Eden to work the ground land from which he was taken. So he's saying now, watch this. He drove out the man, verse 24, at the east and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim, cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to do what? To guard the way to what? To the tree of life. 
So as the promise keeper, God makes a promise. Let us make man the lights in our image. Let them have dominion. He's just declaring. He's just declaring. From Genesis chapter 1, all you hear is God's word. And God said. And God said. And God said. What was God doing? God was declaring promises. And God said, and it was so. And God said, and it was so. And God said, and it was so. So when God speaks over your life, it has to be what he said. Creation, it gets it, but we are the greatest creation, and we're confused about it. He says, let there be the sun. It comes up. It does not say anybody's permission, and it rises again. The sun just obeys what God said it to do. And he makes man. And because the power of choice, the ability to choose, we miss what God wants for us. The promise keeper, two things. is number one, he promised never to leave us. And number two, write this down, he was protecting his promise. He was protecting his promise. That they're going to live forever with him. Live forever with him. And so that's the backdrop of which Paul is writing to Titus now. And he's saying, Titus, you have to understand this particular teaching that he'll never leave you. So, so Titus, have courage, have hope, have faith, have patience, have assurance. God is with you. He's with you, Titus. And number two, he's going to protect his promise. So whatever word that God spoke over your life, he is going to protect it. And how does he do that? Come on, fellas. You go to Hebrews chapter 4. For the word of God is sharpening a two-edged sword. You see the connection? That pierces to the vine of sunder and knows the spirit, the joints, the marrow, and the end of the heart. And so he's saying now that if you want to know the promise keeper, read his word. Why? Because the word of God protects his promise. In other words, when you read a promise, it connects to the promise keeper. So when your feelings are one way, you go to the promise keeper and not just look at the promise. So the point is this. What is the promise? This is the promise. And John writes about this. And John says this in 1 John 2 verse 24. Because Paul begins and says in hope of what? And so in 1 John 2 24 and 1 John 2 25 John actually explains what I just taught you from Genesis chapter 3. John says, let me give it to you now in a version of the New Testament. And so John goes up now in 1 John, turn your Bibles there, because he now says, um, I will never leave you, is really this. In 1 John 2 verse 24. Write this down. So this is the promise. So we looked at introducing the promise keeper. This is the promise. Not promises, this is the promise. It's from this promise that we have the promises of God. And although there are 7,000 promises, I'm going to let you know right now that the Bible reveals to us as we look at church history that there's really three main promises that God has given us. Those three main promises are the ones that we look at and all of life is connected to these three that God has given. And we're going to look into that. But this is the promise. Someone say with me, this is the promise. So someone says, man, what did God promise you? You're going to tell them, this is the promise. When you're looking for financial prosperity and everything like that, and God has promised you those things, yes, he has. But when someone says, what is the promise? You're going to say, ready? This is the promise. And so John writes it now, and John says, number one, this is the promise, fellowship with God. Verse 24, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in what? The Son and who? And in the Father. He's telling us that this was the original design when God said, let us make man. It was the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he made man, and the promise was fellowship with God. And that has never changed. Empires have risen up. Empires have gone down. There's been great inventions and things that happen, but the ultimate promise is this, fellowship with God. So when you're going through a struggle and the unfortunate tragedy of a death of somebody, or you're going through all that's taking place and you're losing hope and you're losing faith, and someone says, why are you still believing God? You tell them, this is the promise. Oh, fellowship with God, come on. Because what I don't want to lose is fellowship with God. And so tragedy and the enemy will bring accusation and the enemy will bring all sorts of things. Listen to me. God is not the author of evil. He's not. Amen. Write that down. He's not. 
So when death takes place, that's because of sin. That's the enemy. God is the God of life. And so if somebody dies, uh, 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 Moses writes about it, about how long we're supposed to live. But don't confuse your earthly temple for your eternal state. Come on. That as the elect, you never die. Uh, Y'all don't believe that? Because when you know that you're invincible, when you understand that death can't harm you, come on, it actually promotes you into your original state. You will do great things for God. You will get out of your comfort zone. The greatest tragedy that we fear is death. That's why when you hear about COVID, we get afraid. Why? Because it speaks of death. And the enemy uses it with the airways and sends it across. Who needs to know how many cases? Come on, somebody. That's the devil. That's the devil trying to get in the atmosphere saying, you can't mess with me because I have the power of death. And God says, you may have the power, but I got the authority. Come on, somebody. And when I speak life, I speak life. When you understand, my God, my God, my God. Lazarus is dead. No, he's not. He's sleeping. Lazarus is dead. No, he's sleeping. That's what Jesus said. But he had to get to their reality. He says, okay, yeah, he's dead. I'm trying to convince you of who you are. But you keep going back to the enemy and you keep promoting lies. So he says, oh, no, no, this was for the glory of God. This was for the glory of God. Come on. This is for the glory of God. So if God allows it, it's for the glory of God. Not because he authored it. Come on, somebody. God is so good. God is so good. Oh, my time is gone. God is so good. Fellowship with God is the promise. Fellowship with God is the promise. Fellowship with God. So whenever we're seeing things that's taking place, um, as a pastor, I'm talking to people, and they're saying, Pastor, my heart is broken. I don't have any hope. I've got this. I've got that. I ask them, what did God promise you? I'm like ignoring the grieving of the loss. But you don't know who you are. I mean, my goodness. Fellowship with God is what the early believers longed for. They longed for it. They're like, we want Jesus. More than anything, it's fellowship with God. And we treat that so lightly. And we allow things in our lives that threatens that. And we allow pleasure to part us from fellowship with God. Not God from us, but us from God. Fellowship with God. How could you walk away from that? That's what there's the big debate about this, this, this God's elect and how do you walk away? The arrogance for us to think that the God who keeps his promises, that we would actually use our own ability to walk away from fellowship with God. <laughs> Minister Blaine, that just blows my mind. When everybody has forsakes you, you, listen, man, we give, we give people more credit than we give God. Someone breaks their promise, ah, you're just human. God doesn't break his promise, you acknowledge his godness. Come on. It's amazing. It's amazing. The amount of people that walk away from church and God's like, what did I do to you? No, what did I do to you? I, I'm still here. Yeah, but this person broke their promise. Yeah, of course they did. Of course they broke their promise. Read Genesis chapter 3. Of course they break their promise. But God says, I'm going to fellowship with you because this is the promise. And so this nation, why I believe God is working this nation, because God won't break his promise. You hear what I'm saying? Church, we should be the ones who shouts loud, this is the promise. Say it with me, this is the promise. Fellowship with God. He's not finished. And then he goes into verse 25 of 1 John chapter 2, verse 25. And he says, and this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life.
I am absolutely consumed with this passion inside of me. Please, for the love of God, stop living comfortable and go after the promises of God in your life. Knowing the promise keeper will never leave you or forsake you. Please just don't get fire insurance. But get on fire for the one who loves you. If all you're satisfied with is you said a prayer when you were a kid, if that's all that God means to you, if your heart is not, is not being broken for, for broken promises made by people, come on, we got politicians and we got celebrities who will make a promise and they'll break it and we give them grace and forgiveness. And here God is saying, what about me? We would have to get a massive building of all the people who left church. Why? Because they said God did something to them. That if they realized that God says, I never left you. That was the devil. It wasn't me. That was someone who used their ability and allowed the devil to come in. Jesus called it out. He says, hey, um, the moment Judas made a choice, Satan entered him. That's what was used by the enemy to destroy what they thought was the purpose of God. But Jesus recognized, destroy this temple, come on, ooh. And in three days I'll rise up again, why? Because my daddy promised me I'll make it back to glory, come on, ooh. I'll make it back to where he is. As we turn our voices and we sing this anthem, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, He's the light in the darkness. So God promised me, promised you, your children and your household will be saved. The enemy wants to get your focus on your kids' bad behavior and lose the Promise Keeper. And so you're praying for someone to be healed and you're believing God and you're declaring. God and, and the person passes away, what you do is you walk away from God. God's not a healer. And God's like, that wasn't my promise. Come on. My promise is eternal life. And so here's how I pray from now on. I say, God, have mercy. Your word says you are the healer. And so as much that I could do on this side of heaven, I speak life. But I am comforted in knowing that that person knows you. Oh, come on. And they will never lose their fellowship with you. Come on. And while my heart is heavy because I want that person to fellowship with me, more importantly, I want them to fellowship with God. I'm not that selfish. Come on, somebody. I would rather than fellowship with God and live forever than live here and not know Jesus and die and be separated forever. Let's get a priority straight. This is the promise. TGP. Fellowship with God. Fellowship with God. Oh, we're going to sing, but can I just, even the devils know whether you're fellowshiping with God. Apostle Paul was walking around casting out devils. Get out, get out, get out. Just get out. Some people saw that and says, hey, hey we want to do that as well. And they walked up to the demon. They went and they says, in the name that Paul preaches. <laughs> And the demon opened up his mouth and says, um, Paul I know, fellowship with God. And Jesus I know because he whooped us. <laughs> Paul I know. And Jesus I know. Oh, come on, somebody. But then he says, who are you? He didn't care if you were a creation of God. Who are you? He didn't care if you are a child of God. Who are you? Come on. He 
one or do you know you're chosen? Come on. Do you know that you have eternal life? Do you know that God lives in you? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so what we must understand is this. This is the promise. Fellowship with God and life eternal. Mm. You get a bad report. Fellowship with God. Come on. And life eternal. My finances are dry. Fellowship with God and life eternal. He's the way maker. He's the miracle worker. And he is the promise keeper. Praise team. Come on. Let's sing that anthem. I want you to shout, this is the promise. Come on, shout it. This is the promise. Fellowship with God. When all tragedy is taking place, the people are saying, where is your hope? Fellowship with God. What does your marriage need? Fellowship with God. What does your finance need? Fellowship with God. God is opening doors for this ministry. And one of the things I'm going to keep preaching is the promises of God. It's fellowship with God. It's the Son and the Father living inside of me. Oh, come on. Waymaker. Miracle worker. He's the promise keeper. He's the light in your darkness. Come on. That's who he is. That's who he is. If you lost a loved one in 2021, he's still the promise keeper. And he's going to turn it around. 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 Because the grave won't hold them. The grave won't hold them. Roll back the stone, Lazarus, come forth. Come on. That is who? This is the promise. Come on. Promise. Woo. He is. He is. Come on. Oh, yes. 